governments have thought that, uh, I mean, history can be rewritten uh, according to their, their whims. Uh, and that is a tragedy. How do you have some kind of vision uh, for uh, a society going forward that, that can, instead of being highly divisive, can actually unify people? We can say that there was um, a betrayal of the ideals of Qadi Azam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Viewers, welcome to our new program on Pakistan in Perspective. We have in our studio today Dr. Aisha Jalal, who is a professor of history in the University of Tufts and author of a number of books. And we also have with us today Matthew Nelson, who teaches at the Department of Political Science and the School of Oriental Studies, University of London. He is author of books, and especially the, in the shadow of Sharia is his, one of the books he has written. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome, Dr. Aisha. Uh, Aisha, we have, uh, have been talking about the Pakistan situation and the Pakistan social political conditions. We, uh, Pakistan started, the founding fathers of Pakistan, they had a secular vision of what the state is going to be. And uh, what we see today is exactly the opposite of the vision of the founding fathers. How did that change come about? Well, let me first say that this dichotomy that, is, that you've just uh, mentioned between religious and secular, I think is, is, is vastly misunderstood. Um, so when we say that they had a secular vision, what did they mean by that vision? Uh, secularism in the subcontinent, in South Asia, uh, was not uh, a separation of church and straight, state. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, religious neutrality. In other words, uh, that, that the state will not uh, privilege one group as opposed to the other. It was, a, it was a case of religious neutrality. So if you mean by that the secular term, then yes, because relig religion was a part of secular. I mean, the, 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 what you call the secular. It, it, it was not a religious or sacrilegious. Exactly. I mean, to, to call it la diniyat, as yeah. some people mis, um, uh, wrongly uh, interpret secularism, is, 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 is not correct. Because the term for, for to be anti-religious is to be an atheist, not a secularist. But mm. in, in the Pakistani context, there is this misconception that when you talk about a secular vision, they think it's a ladiniyat or anti-religious so, so can I can I say then, uh, in order to be uh, on the same page, uh, yes. uh, in order to in order to make it more clear for G our viewers, G G instead of using the word secular, can I say that our founding fathers had a pluralist attitude? Yes, absolutely. It it, um, it was an it was an inclusionary attitude. Uh, the, the idea was to build a a, a, a democratic uh, state. Uh, that was clearly the vision as far as uh, Qaeda Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah was concerned, and and, and several of his close associates. Yeah. Uh, so why have they lost this vision? Well, I mean, there I think the answer lies with the political history of the country, the way the evolution took place and why it was felt uh, at, at various stages to target some groups uh, and, 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 and lose that principle of religious neutrality. For the state to become a definer of religion, I mean, if you remember the, uh, the Munir report of 53, uh, one of the things that Munir, the report made very clear was that the moment you begin to get into the enterprise of defining who a Muslim is, the state that is, is that you create havoc because no two Muslim ulama could agree on the definition of that. So one definition would exclude invariably the others. So that would destroy the position of religious neutrality. So rather than the separation of church and state issue, this is about religious neutrality, which yes, has been lost for political reasons. No, but, but that, uh, that neutrality uh, was lost on account of sunda, uh, certain groups working Yes, but let's also not forget that in 53, a there was a rejection of this kind of uh, a position where the religious neutrality was being compromised, and the Pakistani, those in authority at that stage, rejected that demand. It was crushed. It was much later than that the Ahmadi community again uh, is, is, is ostracized in 74. It happens much later. So I do think that those 21 years are important to understand why it takes so long, because the demand to expel the Ahmadi community uh, was there before partition. So I think those, th those periods have to be explained as well. Pakistan has not been on a road which is leading inevitably to this, I think. I think that there are lots of opportunities. Decisions were made at certain times for political reasons, uh, which is why the neutrality of the state was no, lost. No, that, that demand for declaring Ahmadis non-Muslims 
uh, it had its uh, uh, had the sound was there even before partition. Uh, absolutely. So th that was not an ideological or purely religious issue. It had on political or economic dimensions. Absolutely, it did, it did have a political dimension, a very strong one. And you might also recall that that the, that. Uh, Qaeda Azam uh, rejected that demand. This was a demand that the Erhar made in 1937, a condition of their electoral pact with uh, the Muslim League, and he did not agree to it. Uh, so I, I do think that, because he realized that the, any conception of citizenship would have to be inclusionary. And the moment you get into the business of excluding people, then there is no end to that, basically. I mean, once you exclude one group, then the other groups can also want to exclude them. So it's, I mean, that's where you lose the principle of neutrality. So I, th I hope I've explained myself. The, uh, you have, you have wonderfully explained yourself. <coughs> uh, Matthew, uh, to start with, as I say, the Pakistan people, the people who are fighting for Pakistan, they, they were working on a modernist agenda and they were modernist people. They wanted a modern Islamic state based on uh, democratic principles. But, uh, the, uh, the change seems to have come when after the death of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the objective resolution was passed. How did that affect the course? One of the things that's so interesting about the objectives resolution for me is, is even some of the, the prehistory of the objectives resolution, even before Jinnah had died. Um, you have as early as November 1947, um, a fellow from Bengal, Fazl Rahman, um, working as part of a, an education commission to try to decide how to stitch Pakistan together. And this is one of those ironies of good intentions, uh, that in his anxieties, even being from Bengal, about what he called provincialism, he wanted to emphasize the common Muslimness of Pakistan. And in doing that, um, he brought to attention of the Education Commission an, an emphasis on what he sort of loosely called at the time an ideology of Pakistan or an ideology of Islam, which was an effort to stitch the country together. But it set in entail a, a slippery slope where bringing the terms of Islam into the community or into the state, really, and its idea of how to bring its um, population, its very diverse population together, uh, it emphasized not provincial diversity, not linguistic diversity, but a common religious identity, which later finds expression, even in the form of the objectives resolution. So I think the, um, the intention of emphasizing Islam to sort of paper over some of the provincial differences was perhaps in its first manifestation an understandable intention. Um, but it set in train so many difficulties, which are exactly the difficulties that Professor Jalal has mentioned. Once you emphasize the importance of Islam, the question Im immediately arises, which Islam? And then there's a competition, a political competition uh, about that. And it's, it, it, it helps to understand some of the competition in 1953. The one I, thing that I think I might want to add on the objectives resolution is that, you know, g given the context of the objectives resolution, which, which Matt has very nicely explained to us, um, it was seen by the leadership, the political leadership, as a victory because they had actually prevented the ulama mm -hmm. from actually succeeding in becoming a super parliament, which is what they wanted. They wanted to sit on, on, on judgment on parliamentary uh, legislation. So I think at that stage, it was seen to be a sort of a victory, quote unquote, of the so-called secular uh, lobby. Uh, but clearly, a space was created at the same time. But there was nothing inevitable for things to go completely out of control. I mean, they had actually at that moment contained the threat, but yes, created a space and, and giving them the moral legitimacy to always hold the state responsible for not implementing Islam according to their vision. Uh, but, but I do think that it's important to realize that the objectives resolution was seen then as a success yeah, seeing, in fending off these people. So seeing the objective resolution with the hindsight is quite different of how it was seen at that time. Exactly. When, when we look That's at it I'm from the hindsight, then the, it turns out that it is there that we went exactly, wrong. Exactly. But at that time, the people had good intention. Even Absolutely. It so, was an Islam so, of many conversations. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It was an Islam of many regions, an Islam of many languages, literally. Um, and it later became an Islam of only one interpretation. But, but uh, Matthew, as you say, it was, uh, Islam was used as a symbol of unification, mm. but ultimately it turned out to be divisive, mm -hmm. mm. uh, as we see now today, yes, the Pakistan situation has uh, turned out to be divisive. So uh, can you point out certain landmarks where this deviation took further turns? There are so many landmarks. I mean, one of the, um, one of the paradoxes of this emphasis on, on Islam um, is the difficulty of translating between an appreciation for um, one faith, one prophet, one book, one, 
and the many different ways in which that one is engaged. Um, and insofar as the default tends to uh, emphasize the one, uh, the focus on the many and the variety tends to be lost. So in my own research, for instance, um, I'm interested in the ways in which Islamic law is engaged at a very local level and the fact that people have um, lives that touch upon matters of Islamic law, whether they're matters of property or matters of marriage and so on, and lives are quite diverse. Um, but the law, as it has been uh, formulated and put into practice in, in Pakistan, doesn't necessarily allow for some of this um, local variability. Uh, so for instance, one of the uh, sort of classic moments of uh, difficulty when it comes to stressing one Islam was, of course, <laughs> Zia's emphasis on zakat uh, and the idea that different groups of Muslims have different approaches to zakat. And of course, the intention of a state-based form of zakat um, may have been understandable, but in practice, of course, it immediately confronts the different ways in which people bring zakat. But that that is practice. where you go when you go in details of the implementation of mm. what Islam really means and what Islam. But when you come to the uh, notional aspect, ideological aspect, then it is there that you change the mindset, mm. and that mindset has turned out to be divisive. The education system, as we. Um, Look, know very well. Are allowed yeah, to speak yeah, on yeah, this yeah. one? I mean, why? I mean, Islam is meant to have been a cement and has turned out to be divisive. So why? It's 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 what it was sought. It's what it sought to mm. achieve. I mean, instead of really unifying, it denied diversity as he, regional diversities. That's why it became divisive. Not because it was. I mean, this was a. I mean, Islam is not an issue. Actually, but one thing that works is. I mean, unifying is Islam, but to use it to deny difference, to deny regional diversity, to deny political power, that is the reason why it is divisive. It's the utilization of it by the, by the center, you, you Islam mean, you, in and of itself. You, you mean the uh, state-sponsored Islam? That's right, that's right, that's, that's, what, I mean. that's what I mean, right. that's divisive. So, so state-sponsored Islam yes. is something which is divisive. That's right. And, and if I can pick up on that, one of the, again, unintended ironies of a state-sponsored Islam. Um, I can even imagine a state-sponsored Islam with, with good intentions, where the idea is to promote, and I've seen this in my research, an emphasis on equality, that Islam can promote equality. But this particular understanding of equality has been pri quite problematic. This particular understanding of equality is equality exists where everyone is exactly the same. <laughs> Um, and if that particular understanding of an equality facilitated through a language of Islam is emphasized, then of course we, we inevitably ask, well, what does it mean for everyone to be the same? And that's where issues of doctrine and ideology come in, and people begin to believe that equality requires perfect homogeneity. And it's exactly the understanding of secularism that um, Professor Jalal was mentioning earlier, um, which is a certain... Um, uh, neutrality, where equality doesn't mean homogeneity. Equality means equal recognition across a variety of differences. That's a very different understanding of equality, but it's equally, in, in my understanding, a form of equality. No, the, the, the equality, you see, where when we come to the equality clause or the equality concept, mm. then and the what we have said, I've been talking of pluralism and secularism, whatever different connotations they may have. One way of putting it is that the state has to be equidistant mm. from all groups. So when the state enters into religion and recognizes one religion or sponsors one religion, then it no longer remains equidistant from all religious groups. It's, 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 and, and that militates against the pluralist character okay. of the ever society. Yes, that, that, that is correct. One of the, the particularly challenging issues here that I've um, taken an interest in as well is, is the issue of privacy. Um, and the degree to which the state feels an obligation to take control over all areas. Because insofar as a state that assumes itself responsible for all areas, the state tends to monopolize the rules for all areas. Um, and if the state recognizes some um, appreciation for privacy, then the state holds itself back. The state restrains itself and leaves some spaces where the state is not uh, defining the rules and where different groups can do different things. Um, different individuals can do different things. So an appreciation for this private sphere, this space beyond the state control, is exceptionally important for preserving pluralism. So, so what you're saying is that uh, uh, religion and politics should be kept apart in the state affairs. 
not necessarily kept apart. As, as Professor Jalal was mentioning earlier, uh, you can have a, um, an appreciation for, for privacy and have a state that um, has an engagement with lots of different religious um, expressions, whether they're institutional, whether they're legal, whether they're sort of um, in, in the sphere of ideas. If I may also make one point that this insistence on this separation between religion and secular, as you were presenting, also has a downside. The downside has been that those who regard themselves as secular are not really able to engage with those who stand up as the guardians of the religion, with the result that the schism has actually generated more difficulty because the people who are going to challenge the religious, so-called religious people about their interpretations are, are unable to do so because they don't speak their language, whereas the religious can speak the language uh, of the secular quite easily and use modern technologies to advance their point of view. So it is a political issue. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Because it, will not, it doesn't serve the purpose, that, but the issue is about being able to reclaim the religious as well and talk about it intelligently. Who are they to, to interpret it in a particular way? You've got to be able to talk to them on their, on the, on their, on their terms. I also think that um, a pluralism-friendly approach to yeah. religion um, draws on features of religion itself, That's like right. modesty. That's right. Yes, For right. instance, a pluralism-friendly approach to Islam recognizes its human limitations. Exactly. Um, and I think that's very important. That is true, but uh, pluralism and equidistant from uh, all religious groups or ethnic groups, uh, equidistant in every respect, that, that thing, does it not absolutely disappear when the state adopts a religion as state religion and state sponsors that religion and def tries to define what religion a person belongs to? Yes, I do think it does, and that's what's happened to Pakistan. I mean, I mean, you know, the, it, it, they, but there was resistance uh, as late as '74 to that, to being mm -hmm. to, to define a Muslim, and that's why I emphasize the '53. I mean, the the Munir report uh, and the categorical refusal to do so, and what happens. And I and I would only say you asked about the the the, the, the main sort of turning points. I think what hasn't been brought up here adequately is the extent to which the global context of Islam played a very major role in the, 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 the Ahmadi question in 74, in determining the Ahmadi question. I think there was a global assertion of Islam, um, something I've written about, and I do think that it is, uh, it's extremely important to realize that, that it impacted on what happened here too, because the demand for uh, declaring the Ahmadis non-Muslims is very old, as you acknowledged, but why does it happen in 74? And but look at look at look at the look, look at see, the sort of trend there. That, 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 that is precisely what I'm trying to understand. In '53, Munir inquiry report right. emphasized very properly that if you start defining the religion of a person, you land in difficulty. Right. And no two ulama agreed on the definition of a Muslim. Right. And in '73, a person who was supposed to have a secular outlook, like Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, he takes up the issue and he uh, sets upon deciding who a Muslim is, defining who a Muslim is. So that was not a religious agenda. There was something political behind it. We were, uh, uh, is that not right or how? Well, yes, I mean, it, it, it was a political uh, agenda. I, I mean, I'm suggesting that it was tied up with the larger uh, issue, I mean, with the, with, the, with the broader Muslim world, I mean, and, and the sort of imperatives that were uh, there post-71, the loss of East Pakistan, um, the greater shift towards uh, West Asia or the Middle East, the concern for the, to build this, the, 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 the nuclear device, the nuclear weapon, uh, the acquisition of the nuclear weapon, all of that played a role in which the Ahmadi question then becomes uh, uh, central because that, I mean, th that's the concession that has to be made in order to satisfy many of the other imperatives that he's pursuing at that moment. So yes, it was a political decision. It, it, it was a political decision and Ahmadi issues was propped up as an excuse that's right. to over for those political Absolutely. political It was objectives. very unfortunate, but yes, it was. And a as a result of this definition, what happened thereafter? Well, uh, I mean, uh, legalized uh, discrimination uh, against the Ahmadis. Yeah, but legalized discrimination, not only against Ahmadis. It, uh, did Others it not well. result into further fragmentation of the Pakistani society? No, no. It, what the, it the, did... The, uh, the, kind of, the kind of exclusionary fatwas from all other groups Absolutely. and the different sectarian uh, groups coming Absolutely, forward. Absolutely, because, I mean, citizenship or equal rights of citizenship are inherently in, meant to be inclusionary. What, what this did was to inject that exclusionary strain that Qaeda Azam had tried to very hard to resist when he was asked to do so. 
uh, in terms of the Ahmadi community. So that's what it did. And once you inject that exclusionary strain, then nobody really is immune from that. I mean, there are those who think that the Shias should be declared uh, the next minority, uh, the next non-Muslim minority. So it, it, it basically uh, f uh, fueled bigotry to, and, and took it to a, another level. And uh, if I may, when you talk of that global aspect and the global Gee. involvement, that global, uh, you, you talk of nuclear, nuclear power and the uh, fall of East Pakistan and all that. When you talk of that global context, in that global context, the, the concept of jihad has played a role. Well, in that happens a little later, but 70, I mean, in 73 is the quadrupling of oil prices. Uh, that is the moment for the global reassertion of Islam as far as un under Saudi direction to a large extent. And it does have an impact on Pakistan. I mean, the, the, here are the people who had been agitating for a long time uh, uh, for the Ahmadis to be expelled, utilize their linkages with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to, to bring some influence to bear on, 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 on Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. I mean, so I do think that that has to be acknowledged as, as, a, as a reality. If I could add a, another dimension to the historical moment that we're talking about, sort of the, the, the um, Bhutto years in the 70s that were so crucial. Um, in order to defend the vision of Qadi Azam, you would need strong secular voices um, to see that through. And what we see during the late 60s and early 70s is such a thorough fragmentation of the secular left, um, such that, and for reasons that are quite global in scope, you have, on the one hand, secular voices in the left battling one another, some associated with the Soviets, some associated with China, deeply factionalized and therefore becoming less and less effective as a unified secular voice to define some of these spaces that need to be protected. And then, when you have the arrival of Bhutto, he pursues something of a purge of some of the student activists who were so uh, committed to some of the separation of church and state or religion and state that, that we're talking about. And while on the one hand, I think it's true that we can say that there was um, a betrayal of the ideals of Qadi Azam, we can also say that the secular defenders of some of those ideals um, were so thoroughly fragmented that they began to eat themselves. But, but as it is today, the whole of the Pakistan society or the secular mind or the pluralist mind is now held hostage hmm. by the radicals and fundamentalists. That that is what it has come to. And I say you were talking of the global impact. I, I was trying to understand that the global impact of that Islamic resurgence, it had something to do with the promotion of that distorted notion of jihad well, that happens in 79. I mean, after 73, but the process has started much earlier because of the, because of the global reassertion that I'm, I'm referring to from, the, from really before 74, 73. Uh, the jihad idea really sort of assumes, uh, has a life of its own after the Soviet invasion and the promotion of jihad uh, as, as a positive, as, as a state policy. Let me take you back. When, when they struggled during the Pakistan struggle, they, Pakistan Muslim League within it had the Dev Deobandi voice also. That's right. But largely, Deobandi voice were f the followers of the Valiullah's doctrine of jihad. So that doctrine of jihad, which was sponsored by, uh, uh, propagated by Valiullah, uh, on the larger global context, mm -hmm. when you see that, then you can perhaps see certain linkage between the uh, subsequent uh, jihad concepts coming into Pakistan and playing their role. Look, I, I, I really would hate to draw, I mean, for, as, for, as a historian, it's, it's just awful for me to have to draw an, a, a straight line from Baliullah to the contemporary jihadists. I, I have written a book on it and shown how they varied uh, according to circumstance. I mean, there's a, there's a great variability in ideas of jihad. And I think the important point is that Muslims have also not agreed on when it is uh, appropriate to launch a jihad. I think there are many legal requirements that cannot be met. Uh, so, but I think what has to be acknowledged that after 79, a strategic moment was generated where jihad became a good thing to promote. Uh, and Pakistan became a direct supporter of that. I mean, the military regime of Ziaul Haq utilized that moment. And that brought about some qualitative shifts in uh, the relation between Islam and state in Pakistan, which we are still dealing with yeah, the, after effects uh, of. The, the, that 
is where Pakistan has now come to. That's right. I mean, this is basically Ziyaz Pakistan and not Jinnah's Pakistan. So I think that we need to sort of, you know, uh, understand that rather than saying, you know, where it has diverted. Uh, I, I, I'm happy you use that, you use that word. <laughs> it is Ziyaz Pakistan. Jinnah's Pakistan and Ziyaz Pakistan. That's right. So Ziyaz Pakistan has radically changed. The legacies of they are Ziyaz legacies. Uh, so he's Ziyaz had a tremendous legacy. impact on Pakistan. Yes. yes. Uh, and uh, one of the Ziyaz legacies. What, 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 what are the legacies of Ziyaz? What do you say, Matthew? Oh, the Ziyaz, um, the legacies of Ziyaz Pakistan are too numerous to count. I think one of the most important, of course, is this popularization of the term jihad, uh, and the sense that. Um, Popularization of the the dis term jihad, the distorted notion of jihad. J just exactly, um, and just as we were saying, some terms need to be reconsidered. Like secularism needs to be rethought. Jihad itself, as a term, needs to be rethought. Um, it is, of course, in its you know basic form, a, a, a struggle, and the ways in which that struggle takes shape, I think, are um, many and various. And there are, there are ways in which um, the term jihad can be recaptured to articulate a fo a space for individuals in a community to strive for better understanding without taking up Zia's understanding no, no, but of the, jihad. But the, the, the notion of jihad that we are now presently confronted with is, is the notion yes. where, where you, you go out killing people because they're infidels, or even you go out killing your co-religionists because you think they are not following the, but, uh, the but truth. It's being, it's being, it's being uh, contested, this interpretation. I think, I think we have mm -hmm. to concede that, again, I mean, the point I'm making, that it's always been contested. Undoubtedly, non-state actors have turned what used to be um, a, 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 a sort of uh, a, a collective duty into an individual duty. Uh, they've turned uh, the greater jihad into the lesser jihad and the lesser jihad into the greater <laughs> jihad. Yes. So yes, that has all happened. But there is still the contestation continues. People are not accepting it. People are fighting it. I think within the Muslim community, there are voices from across the globe. So I think that is positive. I mean, one has to acknowledge that. Certainly one of the recent turning points um, that I think we can attribute to Zia's Pakistan um, was the assassination of uh, Salman Taseer. Um, and the ways in which, uh, I think even in Pakistan, um, people were surprised by the degree to which the assassin was not condemned by the public at large. Um, I think- see, Yes, that, that is what I said, that is where we have landed. Yes. On, on account of this mindset which has been hmm. uh, created by the house legacy. And uh, this is something uh, which, uh, which causes anxiety mm -hmm. in the thinking minds of Pakistan. It, I think it brought home, um, some of the most well-known lines from the Munir report. Mm. Um, the line suggesting we can easily see where it will lead mm. if we suddenly start believing that That's we right. can take upon ourselves the responsibility for declaring someone a kafir and then killing That's that person. Um, it, that very uh, concern took shape most poignantly after the, the assassination of Salman Taseer. Well, I, I think that's about all the time we have today. It has been a very, very in, insightful and illuminating discussion and uh, how we have come to this and the legacy of Zia as compared to the concept of Jinnah and uh, the state of affairs where we have now landed. And uh, what would you say, Aisha, uh, we can look forward in the future? Well, I mean, I, I think it all depends on the decisions that Pakistanis make today. I mean, I cannot determine those decisions. It all relies in the domain of historical contingency. It's, it's about human choice. There's no inevitability that Pakistan is going to go off the rails, continue to go off the rails. Uh, I think that if Pakistanis decide concertedly to change their mind, change their heart, uh, things will change. So the, the, that's a note of hope. <laughs> the, uh, what we need is the determination of the Pakistani right. people. And what we need is the silent majority to speak up. Yes, absolutely. And uh, viewers, that are about all the time. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, this is all about today's program. We'll see you again on the next program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aisha. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.